beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day. Okay, that's enough of that. Hi, boys and girls. Welcome today. Today we're going to talk about neighbors. Can you say neighbors? Neighbor. Sure you can. I knew you could. Okay, that's enough of that. That would be annoying if I did a whole half hour of that. But when I think about neighbors, the first thing that comes to my mind is Mr. Rogers with his sweater and everything. And so we're going to talk about neighbors because last time we met when I was here, we, we were talking about the scribe who asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second was to love your neighbor as yourself. So I want to talk a little bit more about neighbors. So we talked for quite a while about the loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I believe that the second part comes along with that. It's like a residual effect. But it, Luke gives a little bit different account of how things went down. He talks about, well, let's go ahead and read it. We're going to get me in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28 is where we're starting. Luke 10, 25 through 28. Luke 10, 25 through 28. Said it three times for my college preaching professor, so we're good. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now stop there for a second. So Jesus said, when confronted, he said, Well, what do you think? The guy was, basically he was looking for a fight. We have to think about the context of this. The the expert in the law, the lawyer that you're talking about, it was the law as in God's word. He thought he knew it backwards, forward, upside down, sideways, knew the law of God. And he wanted to test Jesus. He wanted to know what Jesus was going to say and if it was going to line up with his thinking. We never do that, right? We never look at the scripture and try to make it fit into what we believe and we, what we understand. That never happens. But <sighs> Mr. Rogers has to take off his shoes. But so Jesus said, what do you think is the way to eternal life? And the, the expert in the law said what he thought was the way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. But then he asked, well, who is my neighbor? The reason why he was asking this, it wasn't just because, you know, that's great, Jesus. I really want to clarify so that I can make sure that I love my neighbor and do the right. No, he was trying to pick a fight. He was trying to discredit Jesus because he was, again, trying to support his thoughts the way that he already believed because the Jewish people especially the experts in the law believed that for one anybody that wasn't born Jewish was a barbarian they just we don't have time for them they are they're trash and so he wanted to justify what he was doing and if you're not one of us you're our enemy is what he wanted Jesus to basically validate what he was his way of thinking and Jesus didn't want to do that he didn't do that because that's not what it was he this guy was trying to test Jesus and Jesus this is why I love Jesus so much because Jesus is so not like me Jesus could have just been like you know if you got the first part right we wouldn't even be having this discussion 
you would already be loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what I would have probably said. You know, sometimes I open my mouth and stupid falls out. But Jesus saw a chance for a teachable moment. He stopped what he was doing. He stopped all this argument. And he's like, okay, boys and girls, it's story time. <laughs> and so he went on to tell what is called a parable. A parable is where basically parallels fiction with truth. And this is what Jesus did. And he went on to share this parable. He, went out, he saw a teachable moment and wanted to point to the kingdom of God. So, we're going to read that starting in verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, having, or leaving him nearly half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, <clears throat> pouring on oil and wine, and he sent, or he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, "Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you." So, which of these? three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell um, to the man who fell among thieves and he said he who showed mercy on him then Jesus said to him go and do likewise so we most of us know this as the story of the Good Samaritan and it's probably one Good Samaritan is probably one of the most known phrases from the Bible we there, are, I tried to research and I decided I got tired of counting how many hospitals in the United States are called Good Samaritan. And there's the Good Sam with a halo on his head, RV club. And Good Samaritan is basically synonymous with somebody that does a good deed, that helps others or takes care, does good things. And it's interesting to point out that Jesus never called him the Good Samaritan. That's a label that man puts on him. What Jesus was wanting us to grasp is the good neighbor policy. And I'm not talking about State Farm. He, <laughs> he wanted us to be good neighbors. And you know, I've focused just, just like, taking this out a little far, further. State Farm, they're a great neighbor as long as you're paying your premiums on time. Good neighbor doesn't worry about those premiums. Whew, that was deep. But, but Jesus wants us to be a good neighbor. That was the moral of the story. And it's important to recognize parables. I said they're, they parallel, parallel real life things and there's a reason, there's a, a, a meaning that you're supposed to get, that you're supposed to understand this nugget of truth. And all of the parables that Jesus told we're all focused on reconciliation and redemption. I think we should sometime do a, par a parable study, but it's on reconciliation and redemption. That is the story that Jesus wants us to see in these parables. And there's all kind. Of, I read some crazy interpretations of what the parable of the Good Samaritan could possibly mean, and it's so wacky. And we miss the point when we start to try and find hidden meanings. So I ask God, what is the core? What is it you want me to learn and to share? And there's a few things that he wanted me to see and wants us to see. First of all, we need to remember all parables point to God and redemption. And so the question was, who is my neighbor? Jesus 
Jesus told this story to explain who and what a neighbor is. So we need to contextualize a little bit about this journey. The the guy that was on the road, the poor soul that got beaten up. So he was on the road from Jerusalem or from yeah, Jerusalem to Jericho and he got overtaken by thieves because this road was a rocky, hilly, dangerous probably thin mainly basically just a path and with all the rocks it, there was all kinds of crags in the in the mountains and stuff there was plenty of places where thieves could hide out and they came out and it was notorious for the danger and the thieves that were would be there and they would kill people and steal their stuff and this is the road that this guy was going down and along came some people we have the victim he got overtaken got robbed got robbed got beaten got left mostly dead and he was unable to care for himself he was unable to save himself i don't even know if he was able to cry out for help it doesn't say we just know that he was naked and bleeding and beaten and almost dead so along comes the priest. The priest just coming down the road. And he probably just on his way thinking about what a great week he had, or what great month he had in Jerusalem. He's coming down the road. He sees this blob of blood, naked blob of blood. And he looks and I can just imagine the, the scene he's playing out in his head. What could happen if he stops? What, well, if I stop, well, I have people waiting for me. I've been gone. It's speculated that this priest, because he was coming down from Jerusalem, he was heading home to Jericho. Most likely he was finishing up a month of service in the temple. So he was anxious to get home to his family. He wanted to see his family. He wanted, he, he's a priest. He can't get his hands dirty with that that stuff and then there be he'd be ceremoniously ceremonially unclean so he'd have to go through all the cleansing rituals and everything before he could then go see his family and do things and well it's getting dark it's getting dark and the same fate that fell on this guy could happen to me i i can't i can't I, and i can't completely blame him because i mean who doesn't want to look out for their own skin but I can't spend my money. I can't do, I can't, and he, he reasoned away why he couldn't help. Now it's interesting that the passage says, by chance, a priest came along. We're not talking about like this, oh, what a happy coincidence. The priest just happened to be coming right after this guy got beaten and almost killed. This was a divine appointment by God. God had gotten this guy ready. He, like I said, he was probably on his way home from a month of preaching and teaching in the temple, which means he had some change. He had some money. He had gotten paid. He had the means to take care of at least some of this man's needs. But he was so caught up in why he couldn't and the the consequences that could possibly face that, and so thinking about himself that he missed a divine appointment, a chance to be a blessing to somebody, a chance to save a life. So that's person number one, not very neighborly, right? Then along came a Levite. Now Levite was another respected leader, religious and political leader, and here he goes. He's coming walking along, and the road to Jer Jericho from Jerusalem we often read, let's go up to Jerusalem. The road from Jerusalem then means that it was headed downward towards Jericho. So it's quite likely that this Levite might not have been too far behind the priest. Maybe they were in the same meetings or in the same temple and the Levite stuck around a little longer for coffee before he came down, whatever. But he could have actually seen the priest from the, the from the de, 
whatever that thing, angle going downward from the road. You know what I'm saying? He could have been above and seen the priest and seen what happened. And, well, he didn't do anything, so I'm kind of off the hook. But I'm going to go over and, you know, I'll, just, I'll take a look. Because it says that he went over and saw, he looked at this person. And he, he saw this person and he did the same thing. He went to the other side, went to the other road, part of the road. He examined and he didn't do anything. He actually, his inact, inaction was an action. He was saying, sorry, your life's not worth my time, my safety, not worth me getting my hands dirty. He saw what happened and it wasn't enough to incite compassion in this person. That, that's sad wasn't enough to incite compassion. Again, not very neighborly. So, then we get the third person in this story. Good Samaritan. We'll just call him Sam for right now. Sam, fortunately Sam arrived on the scene. The context, again, this was a Samaritan, a person that the Jews hated. The Jews hated the Samaritans. It might be interesting if you ever want to to just sort of do some research on this. Time doesn't allow us to go too into detail on this, but the Samaritans were the result of the Assyrians and the Jews intermarrying and producing children that were less than Jewish, which the Jews hated. The Jews hated anybody that wasn't a gen wasn't a Jew. That was a, was a barbarian in their eyes, and the Assyrians led the Jews away from the Lord. So this was the enemy. The Samaritan guy didn't think about all that stuff. He saw a need. He came to the man and the first thing Jesus says, he had compassion on the man. That's the word that sticks out to me so many times in the book of Mark. Jesus had compassion on this person. Jesus had compassion on the blind man. Jesus had compassion on this person. Compassion. He was, he could feel, he could identify with what this person was going through. And he acted upon it. He did something. He knew he had an opportunity to save a life. So what did he do? Well, first of all, he used his resources. Resources talks about how he bandaged the guy's wounds. He didn't have a first aid kit in the glove box of his donkey. That, you know, had some band-aids in it and pulled those out and then back teen. My dad always made sure we had a first aid kit in our cars. He didn't have that. He most likely tore strips of his clothing to bandage people, or bandage this guy. And he used what he had, the resources he had. Well, you know, if I use a little bit of wine, it'll sterilize. If I use the oil, it'll dress the wounds. He used his resources that he was probably spent a lot of money trying to accumulate. Because clothing even back then was not cheap. It was hard to come by. And he tore his clothing. He bandaged this person and poured oil on him to to save him, he sacrificed his resources for the life of somebody else because his money was not as important as this man's life. The life of an enemy, somebody that most likely hated him. He sacrificed his time and his safety. He, he was, people don't just go for a leisurely stroll from Jerusalem to Jericho. Like I said, it was a dangerous terrain, dangerous area. He was going somewhere, and he stopped to take care of this person. And he was putting himself in harm's way because there were thieves all over this place. It was notorious, like I said. And he sacrificed his comfort because he put this guy on his donkey to take him to safety. He had to walk, that means. And it was hot and rough terrain and everything like that. He was sacrificing his comfort for someone else for someone that most likely hated him i think that's a little bit more neighborly to me to me so jesus after telling the story said so which one of these was the neighbor 
And this expert in the law, he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said the one who showed mercy because he still couldn't admit that this, these Samaritans that he hates did something that he wouldn't have, nor, wouldn't have done. And Jesus said, go and do the same. So it is important to meet financial needs of people. But I, as I said earlier, the point of the parables of Jesus is reconciliation, to make people right with God. And so that's how we have to view this. When Jesus said to go and do the same, we know what go and do the same means. It means go save some lives. The Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, it's not a formula. If we do this, if we do, if we, if we go to a place where it's dangerous and we come across somebody that's been hurt and we spend two denarii because that's what he did and if we do that, no, it's not a formula. It's a challenge to our hearts. It should be a challenge to our hearts to see people, to have compassion on people, whether they're dying physically or spiritually, to have compassion on people. Jesus knew at this time what was coming. This was right before he was going to be crucified. He knew what was coming. He knew that he is the answer, the redemptive, st <clears throat> redemptive story. He's the answer to everyone's problems, the dying spiritually. He's the answer. And he told us that it's our responsibility to save lives. We need to pray for seeing eyes, eyes that see those that are hurting, that are, those that are broken, those that are in need. The, the Samaritans saw this naked, bloody mess, but he saw through that and he saw a person. He saw a soul that was in need and he did something about it. He was he had compassion, which means he was compelled to do something about it. Whatever it took, he was willing to do it. We need to be like that. We need to be compelled. We need to see people. We need to pray for hearts like Jesus. We need to see pray for seeing eyes like Jesus. We need to meet people's physical or financial needs when we can. And that means do it in silence. We don't need to get on the horn afterwards and tell people what we did and how wonderful we were. Post a selfie of me dressing the wounds of somebody that's been beaten and all that stuff. It's not about us. Those people have already received their reward. It's not about us. It's not about getting recognition. And we need to treat these people with compassion, with understanding. We need to talk to them, get to know them, not treat them like trash. Oh, well, if you hadn't taken that route to Jericho, you wouldn't have been in this mess. We need to be loving and have the heart of God. We need to meet them where they are and love them in that place. Dress those wounds, set the broken bones, whatever it is, we need to show Jesus and the compassion of Jesus. We need to do it without selfish motives, without trying to lift ourselves up, and we need to stop making excuses. Oh, well, they're a different color skin than I am. Or they, they're a different financial bracket that I'm in or they don't come to church on Sunday mornings but they don't they, and I can't and I, stop stop right there Jesus says that all these people are your neighbors anybody that doesn't know him is dying we need to be agents of reconciliation and save lives we might not always be able to do it financially, but we will always be able to look at somebody and we should be able to see that they're a beloved child of God. We're always able to meet the spiritual needs. I don't care if you are a Bible scholar. I don't care if you 
have the excuse, I don't know the word, I don't know scripture, I don't know this, I don't know this. You have a story, you have a testimony, you have resources that God has given you. A story that you can tell others that doesn't point at me, doesn't point at you, but points in the direction of the kingdom of God. Points towards reconciliation with God. We're always able to meet the spiritual needs of others. So what kind of neighbor are you, are we? Are you like the priest or the Levite? Comfort's the number one thing. Our own, saving our own skin's the number one thing. I don't have time, I can't do this. Eternal life is from God. We can't say we love God and not show mercy towards his people, towards his beloved children. Getting windy. Hopefully it's not too loud in the mic. Sorry for that. There are millions of people. There's millions of reasons why we can't, why we shouldn't reach out. Why we shouldn't be a neighbor to people. Oh, they have far too many tattoos. Or they, all they care about is drinking. All they care about is smoking. Whatever it is. They don't, they're physically offensive. They smell. They don't look like me. The lifestyle that they're leading is offensive to me. We must stop putting limits on the limitless love of God. You catch that? We must stop putting limits on the limitless love of God. We're to be agents of reconciliation for God. We're not here to lift ourselves up. We're here to point in the direction of the Lord. So we need to look for those divine appointments because I believe God does put people in our lives for reasons. Reasons. Maybe they've been to church or heard the word. Maybe they haven't. This building is not the church. You are the church. I am the church. If we know God, we are the church and it's our job to go among the people. Jesus said, never said, go sit in church, wait for people to show up. He said, go make disciples. Go is the first word in that. Go. We need to go where people are, where they're hurting broken people, people that don't know there is an answer, there is a way, there is a God that can heal every single wound, whether it's physical, spiritual, whatever it is. There is one God that can do that. Are you a neighbor? Are we being neighbors? We have a responsibility to point people in the direction of God. It's without Jesus, they're not just physically dying. They are spiritually dying. We can help them to see the way we can be a neighbor that saves lives Jesus has compassion we need to pray for that same compassion we need to pray for eyes to see the hurt the broken people we need to pray to have a heart of compassion like Jesus and we need to pray for boldness to go out and be a neighbor God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example you showed us that what it means to be a neighbor. And Lord, we ask that you give us eyes that see the hurting, the broken, the lost. You give us hearts of compassion like your heart and that you give us boldness to boldly proclaim your word. In Jesus' name, amen.